This is how I created this interactive character using Rive. I started off by designing the character in Adobe Illustrator. Make sure your design can be broken apart like such. I highly recommend naming your shapes and layers as they will translate into Rive's layer panel. For my character, I want the ears to be able to move, so I will separate them from the head, much like I have with the facial features and the limbs. When I'm ready to import my design to Rive, all I have to do is copy and paste the vector art from Illustrator directly into Rive. You can see in the hierarchy that it has retained the same layer structure as an Illustrator. There are some layers I want to rearrange, and thankfully, Rive makes that process super easy and intuitive. For the eyes, I have several pieces working together in this design. The first thing I need to do is clipping mask them so that the irises are contained within the shape. Select the shape or group that you want to clip, then click the clip button, and then select the shape that you want to clip it to, and it's done. Next, I'm going to create a group, place it into my artboard, and then move it around in the hierarchy near the eye layers. So I'm going to bring all the layers that make up the eyes into the group, and I'm just going to name the group Eyes. I'm also going to create a group for the eyebrows as well. Next, I'm just going to rearrange the hierarchy a bit so it keeps things nice and tidy. You may have noticed that there's a gradient missing from my design, and that's because some gradients don't always translate to Rive from Illustrator very well, but thankfully it's really easy to recreate these gradients right within Rive. In my case, this works out perfectly since the gradient on the face needs to be able to move as a facial feature. So I'm going to use the ellipse tool in Rive to recreate the red gradient on the top of the head. I'll put the ellipse into a group. And I'll call it red. Then I'm going to clip it to the face shape beneath. Next, I'll add some linear gradients to both the ears as a way to add more dimension. Next, I'm going to go ahead and create a new ellipse, add a dark gradient to it to act as a shadow where the head and the body intersect. In Rive, you can directly edit vertices by selecting the path in the hierarchy and then clicking Edit Vertices in the Properties panel. Once I have my shape ready, I'll go ahead and add the gradient fill. You can also work with blend modes, but in this case, it wasn't necessary. And much like the red gradient that I used, I'm also going to clip this to the head shape. Now I'm going to go ahead and add some gradient accents to the feet. And in my case, I also need to readjust the shapes by editing the vertices. And thankfully, Rive makes editing shapes super intuitive and easy to do. At this point, my character is looking a lot more complete. So now let's start making it interactive. I'm going to create a new group layer and call it Track Front. And then in the Properties panel, I'll set the style to Target. I'll duplicate this layer and rename the duplicate to Track Back. This is so that elements in the background will move opposite to those in the foreground. If it doesn't make sense yet, just bear with me because it's all going to come together soon. Next, I want to create a hitbox so that it will detect the movement of my cursor when it enters and exits the frame. The hitbox doesn't need to be visible to the artboard, so I'll just delete the fill and then lock the layer.
And lastly, before we do anything else, make another target layer and call it cursor. I can now toggle over to the animate screen and start working with the timelines, inputs, listeners, and conditions. I'm going to create a Boolean and call it tracking. Then I'll select the hitbox in the hierarchy and create three listeners. For the first hitbox, I'm going to set the tracking on pointer enter to true. And for the second hitbox listener, I'll set tracking on pointer exit to false. On the third hitbox listener, I want pointer move to align to target, and then select the cursor as the target. Then we can start adding translation constraints to our front and back targets. For the tracking back target, the strength needs to be negative 100%. And for the front target, it will be default at 100%. If 100% ends up being too strong, you can lower the strength to 50% or whatever works for you. Later on in this video, I do end up lowering it to 50%. So now I'm going to go ahead and start with making the eyes interactive. The first thing to do is to realign the anchor point of our shapes to wherever our cursor target is. In this case, it should be in the center of the face for our character. This could be done by pressing Y, and then I can go ahead and move the anchor point wherever I wish. I can then add translation constraints to the eyes. So I'll go ahead and set the constraint target to track front, and I'll set the strength to 35%. Then, in the timeline panel, I'm going to go ahead and duplicate the current timeline and rename them. One will be tracking off, and one will be named tracking on. So, I'm going to go ahead and enter the state machine and drag our tracking on timeline in. I'll go ahead and connect the tracking off timeline to tracking on. Click on the transition, and then I'm going to go ahead and add a condition. For this, we're going to go ahead and choose tracking and set it to true. Then I'm going to go ahead and drag a connection from tracking on to tracking off. So in this case, the condition will be tracking set to false. So that there's a smooth transition between both timelines, I'll go ahead and set a transition duration of 300 milliseconds for both transitions. It can also help to check the box, allow exit during transition. The next thing is to make sure the constraint for track front is targeting cursor and track back is targeting track front. I'm also changing the strength to 50%, like I said before. Now when I play the state machine, our design should come to life when our mouse enters the hitbox. You can also test the rig by selecting the cursor in your hierarchy and moving it around. You can see how the track front and track back targets are affected by cursor movement. Uh, remember to always undo and return your cursor back to its initial position though. So far we've only been tracking objects to the front, so now we're going to go ahead and select the objects we want to track to the back. In this case, the head and everything that sits behind the face is going to be on track back. I'll go ahead and add constraints to the rest of the facial features. I'll adjust strength accordingly, depending on its location in the assumed 3D space. It makes more sense for the nose and the mouth to move more than the rest of the face. So that will get a higher strength than the rest. Now that we have constraints applied and we have a working rig, we can start adding in more details that will enhance the experience. Timelines in Rive work much like timelines in After Effects compositions. Every shape can be animated. So let's go ahead and make the eyes close by keyframing the Y scale of the eye shapes. There is also the ability to ease keyframes using keyframe interpolation curves. I'll extend the duration of the timeline to 10 seconds and copy and paste the keyframes across the timeline. 
I'll set both timelines to loop so that animations will continue indefinitely. I'll also copy this animation over to the other timeline for tracking on so that the cat blinks regardless of whether mouse tracking is active. You can also layer animations and have multiple timelines active at one time. So I'm going to go ahead and call our main layer tracking layer and make a new layer called tail movement. Then I'll duplicate one of our timelines and remove the blinking animation from it. And we're going to use this timeline to animate just the tail. This is a great opportunity to utilize the bone feature in Rive. So I'm going to go ahead and create some bones and then I'm going to create a group and group the tail and the bones together. With the path of the tail selected, I can click bind bones and select the bones we want to attach to the tail shape. Now I can go into the path, edit vertices, and use the bone weight tool to tell the bones what part of the shape each bone will control. In this case, there are three bones along the tail indicated by three colors. I want the root bone in blue to only control the base of the tail, and bone one, which is in yellow, to only control the middle, and then bone two, which is purple, to only control the end of the tail. This can be done by selecting the vertices and their handles and adjusting the bone strength percentages. So essentially, each bone will control 100% of their respective areas that I designate. When completed, you can rotate the bones and see them in action. So in this case, I'm going to go ahead and keyframe the rotation property for each of these bones and create the animation for the tail. And just like that, we have an animated tail that loops perfectly. So back in our state machine, with the tail movement layer selected, I'll drag over the tail animation timeline and connect it to the entry module. And just like that, we have our interactive cat with the eyes blinking and the tail moving despite being on different timelines. At this point, it's all about adding in the fine details, more animations, and background elements to make a fun and engaging interactive experience that can easily be embedded on your website or application.